Hey, good morning. Um, I'm going to start with the first case presentation this morning. <clears throat> and um, this is something that um, I observed and others have observed uh, in neurosurgery related to posterior petrous face meningioma. It's a particular aspect of the anatomy of uh, the, the audio vestibular apparatus, which most neurosurgeons don't know or don't remember. Um, but here's a, a case example. Uh, it was a 35 year old woman uh, who was seen by way back in 2012 for a second opinion. And she'd suffered two episodes of true vertigo in the years prior. She underwent CT, <clears throat> MR imaging, and she had no subjective hearing loss, but she'd not had an, an audiogram. And um, she had no complaints of dizziness, or no, no complaints of tinnitus, but some intermittent dizziness. <clears throat> she was slightly overweight, but um, past medical history otherwise negative. And she had a normal neurologic exam. So <clears throat> for the residents, uh, we, I use this at case conference was to make the distinction between vertigo, which is the illusion of movement and dizziness, which is a subjective symptom without the uh, hallucination of movement of the external world. And um, so this patient, uh, in terms of her workup, uh, she's pretty young to have a symptom complex similar to Meniere's disease, which is endolymphatic hydrops. And uh, she did have an audiogram, which uh, was basically within normal limits. Uh, she had ENG electronystagography, which suggested that uh, there was an abnormality uh, or asymmetry between left and right of the vestibular apparatus and function. And the patient underwent uh, further imaging uh, with MR. And you can see here that this axial T1 fat suppressed post contrast image shows on the left-hand side in the posterior petrous face, that is the interval between the internal auditory canal and the sigmoid sinus. You can see that there's a plaque of enhancement, homogeneously enhancing lesion here. If you look anteriorly, you can see the cochlea, you can see the labyrinth, you can see the intraosseous portion of the vestibular aqueduct here. And these are the um, T2 weighted sequences where you can see these semicircular canals in the cochlea and the start of the uh, vestibular aqueduct heading down towards the region of the jugular uh, foramen. So the question would be, how can this small tumor be related to the patient's symptoms? Is it possible? Uh, are the symptoms fictitious? Uh, the usual things that we would try and sort out. Uh, but I'd seen a couple of patients with this abnormality, uh, symptom complex with a a very small tumor positioned right in this same spot. So uh, we recommended uh, initially a period of observation for the patient. Uh, the tumor grew slightly, so we recommended treatment, uh, which was a uh, retrosigmoid craniotomy for removal of the tumor. And the reason for that recommendation was the publication of this paper by John Golfinos at um, NYU uh, saying posterior fossa meningium is presenting with Meniere's like symptoms. So tinnitus, high frequency hearing loss and episodes of vertigo. And you can see that um, the three cases that he showed are virtually identical to my case. And um, it turns out that there's a pathologic and, an, and anatomic reason for this because as most neurosurgeons would remember this, but there's a little groove on the posterior petrous face um, just above where the uh, jugular bulb is uh, at the distal part of the sigmoid sinus. So this is the internal auditory canal. This is the arcuate eminence up here, which marks the uh, superior semicircular canal. This is the petrous occipital uh, synchondrosis here. Um, and this is where the inferior petrosal sinus goes entering into the jugular uh, bulb. This is the hypoglossal canal for the 12th nerve. And there's a little horizontal groove, which you can't see looking down on an anatomic specimen of the posterior petrous face. But this is where the membranous portion of the endolymphatic sac comes right out of this bony opening called the vestibular aperture. And the reasons it, it's important is because it connects to the saccule and the utricle, which are part of the 
uh, semicircular canal complex uh, related to the cochlea. Um, and the foot processes or the extra osseous part of the endolymphatic sac enter into the region of the jugular bulb in order to return produced endolymph back to the uh, venous system. So the endolymph is the fluid that's continuously secreted and it has to enter or exit the vestibular apparatus uh, through this pathway. So you can imagine that if the pathway was blocked, you might get accumulation of an endolymph, which is called endolymphatic hydrops, which is the pathologic correlate seen on patients post-mortem with um, Meniere's disease. And it's interesting that apart from some of the conservative measures, one of the surgical treatments for Meniere's is called an endolymphatic shunt. So you can imagine that if you had a tumor positioned right here, it might be interfering with the circulation or reabsorption of the um, endolymph and that by removing the tumor, we're essentially creating a endolymphatic CSF fistula or uh, essentially a functional endolymphatic CSF shunt. Uh, these are some KISS sequences from T2 weighted imaging, just to point out that you can actually see the components of the um, um, endolymphatic sac, semicircular canals. And here's the endolymphatic sac, the oh, portion right here. like grand rounds. And um, you guys have grand rounds here? Yeah, Zoom. Mike, oh, okay. mute your phone. Oh, okay. Where's that? Dr. McDermott, good morning. Yeah. This is Dr. Saxton. How are you? Good. I've got a question for you. Um, at the outset, when she presented, I would imagine everybody must have thought she just had an otolith. And I just figured that she must have gone through a bunch of Bahraini maneuvers where people just kind of tried to throw this poor woman's head around. Uh, to get rid of whatever was causing this here. Yeah, so this, yeah, the patient didn't have a, a symptom complex of benign positional vertigo or benign positional dizziness. And it's the so-called epilay maneuver, which is abrupt extension and, lateral, and rotation of the head in order to quote, dislodge some of these otoliths. Um, that maneuver was not done. Um, the patient for the most part had been regarded as a somatoform disorder um, because, um, you know, the, the individuals couldn't see or didn't understand that. The, and I, in the beginning, I didn't believe it, that there was a correlation between the imaged abnormality and the patient's symptom complex. But yes, you're, you're correct that the two things to consider would be benign positional vertigo um, or benign positional dizziness. She's a little on the young side at age 35. Uh, for that symptom complex. Um, and, uh, you know, she had not seen a neurotologist by the time she had seen me. So I was the one who recommended and made the referral to my colleague for the ideogram and the electronystagography. Um, and so that was the, um, that was the recommendation. You can see here on this imaging study, here's the intraosseous portion of the endolymphatic sac on this patient and it's immediately adjacent to the attachment of the meningium, which overlies the vestibular aperture. So fast forward several years, um, I ended up seeing a number of these people <clears throat> coming into the clinic, not because I was the, the uh, dizziness expert, but because I was interested in meningiomas. And so we've um, we just submitted this paper, resubmitted it to neurosurgery after, re after review and revisions on seven patients with Meniere's-like syndrome, um, a posterior petrous face meningioma overlying the vestibular aperture. All these patients were operated on because of the symptom complex and the corresponding anatomy. Um, six out of the seven people who had the Meniere's-like syndrome of tinnitus or dizziness, uh, six out of the seven had complete resolution of their vertigo after the operation. All had improved tinnitus. And of the five who had impaired hearing pre-op, two out of the five had Im improved hearing post-op and three out of the five remained the same. All these operations were done with uh, neuroautology. So all these patients were seen by the neuroautologist prior to recommendation for surgery. 
uh, we previously published a paper uh, on uh, Petrus face meningiomas, dividing them into anterior, which is uh, between the um, anterior, uh, between the petroclival junction and the internal artery canal, middle Petrus face meningiomas, which span the internal artery canal, so they have components on the anterior, middle, and posterior Petrus face, and then posterior Petrus meningiomas, which lie, as I said before, between the internal artery canal and the sigmoid sinus. And these are the seven patients that presented, and you can see that the tumors are all located uh, over the region of the vestibular aperture. Um, sometimes larger tumors can present uh, with symptoms of elevated intracranial pressure or cerebellar signs, but it's typical when the tumors are small like this that they have the uh, Minier syndrome. And this is the pathologic anatomy. This is the artist rendition of the 7-8 nerve complex coming into cochlea facial nerve. This is the semicircular canals, labyrinth, uh, drainage system of the endolymphatic duct and the sac, and the tumor overlies the endolymphatic sac with possible invasion and disruption of return of endolymph to the, uh, uh, back to the venous system. And this is what the uh, artist depiction of what endolymphatic hydrops looks like with dilatation of components of the um, and a lymphatic system between the scala vestibuli and the scala uh, tympani. And uh, this is an example of an 89-year-old male. This was not my patient. It must, must have been Phil's, uh, of somebody who presented with disequilibrium, uh, was found to have a larger uh, tumor, but it did span the internal auditory canal. But he had many years like symptoms in addition to uh, his facial symptoms. He uh, died post sometime post-operatively from pneumonia, uh, but uh, apparently consented to autopsy. And so you can see here that this is the internal auditory canal. Here's meningioma on the front and back of the bone. This is the extra osseous portions of the endolymphatic sac, uh, but the patient does have pathologic evidence of uh, endolymphatic hydrops towards the apical turns of the of the cochlea. So this was confirmation of one of those patients, in fact, that there, there should be, uh, and there is a pathologic relationship between the tumor location symptom complex uh, for these meningiomas. So um, an interesting, I can remember a lady who came into my office uh, and I had looked at the imaging before I walked into the office and um, she was a little I would say probably doubtful and unhappy with her situation. And I said, oh, um, I said, uh, you know, good morning, Mike McDermott, neurosurgery. And um, um, how are you doing today? And she says, well, I could be better. And I said, oh, and I said, well, how can we make you better? How can we help? And she said, well, somebody could actually figure out what's wrong with me after all these tests. And I said, well, I actually, I th actually think that I know what's wrong with you, which uh, she just smiled and said, oh, really? <laughs> so uh, we didn't start off the best way, but um, um, uh, we, we ultimately, she had exactly this. Uh, we did the operation and thankfully no complications and uh, had great symptomatic relief. So uh, if you ever see one of these tumors, now you know what the relationship is. And if they have, if you do an audiogram and uh, uh, vestibular testing, and the patient seen by a neurotologist who agrees that there is a relationship, you can recommend surgery uh, with you know, very good results in terms of relief of the dizziness or vertigo, relief of the tinnitus, and improvement in hearing in about 40% uh, of patients. Hi, Mike. This is uh, Kevin. Can I ask a question? Those, yeah. those are great case series. You know, so we see these all the time and obviously not everybody that has that aperture yeah. cover develops the symptoms. So is that number one, is there anything that you've seen neurosurgically that may think one patient may be more symptomatic than another? And the other uh, thing is, as far as a uh, research project, you know, we do, we have an endolymphatic hydrops uh, MR protocol where we give them gadolinium and we bring them back four hours later and it diffuses into the labyrinth, and you can see in the lymphatic hydrops on a thin section uh, delayed post-contrast flare. It might be a good idea in these yeah. patients to do those. 
Yeah, I don't know what the relationship, I don't know why some people have it and others don't. I would say it's less than 10% of patients with tumors in, in the posterior petrous face that have this symptom complex. So it has the tumor, you can see most of the tumors are small, but they're strategically located right over the vestibular aperture. And um, the, the big tumors, it's actually not very common to see the same symptom complex. Usually those patients have suboccipital headache syndrome or the symptoms of elevated intracranial pressure. Um, so that's what we're operating on them for, not for this other symptom, audiovestibular symptom complex. Mike, can I ask you a question about surgical uh, nuances? How do you uh, operate? Because it's you know, the dural of, uh, in the area of the dural origin. Do you do anything special with that because of the close proximity of the and the lymphatic so You don't want to damage it even further. You don't no. coagulate or anything. So how do you oh. how do you do that? Well, usually um, there's frequently there's a little bit of hyperostosis there, but we usually drill off the involved dura with a round diamond drill, two millimeter round diamond. And actually, I don't do that. I, you know, because we had this agreement about the cooperative uh, approach to cerebellar pontine angle tumors, whether it was vestibular schwannoma or meningioma with neurotology, we would, we would always, for the most part, if, if possible, we would always do these together. If neurotology wasn't available and I had to get it done, I would just do it myself, obviously, because it's, it's not a complex operation. But uh, they would usually drill um, the bone in that region and drill the dura off to get a Simpson grade one resection. Nothing special done, no particular concerns. The thing that you're, I think, referring to is if you're doing a uh, vestibular schwannoma from a retrosigmoid approach, you can only drill eight millimeters lateral from the posterior lip of the internal auditory canal before you might exactly. run into the. Uh, vestibular aqueduct, and that's presumably part of the reason why patients might have uh, impaired hearing or absent hearing post-op is because you create this in lymphatic fistula. So um, that's that's the one concern. Obviously, when patients have not useful hearing, we don't care. We just drill all the way out laterally, retrosigmoid, and it's not obviously not an issue. But uh, when they're located right over the vestibular aperture, nothing special. Take the tumor out, and it's usually small. It takes you know. 15 minutes, take the tumor out, and then drill the dura off in that region and drill the bone down a bit, but otherwise no special nuances. Mike, good morning. This is Sajil Chowdhury from Boca. Mike, yeah. have, you, have you ever noticed any time, Mike, that you followed these cases and might be some, uh, some tumor recurrence that might have required no, no. radio surgery or no, not in these seven patients. So um, I can, you can see that uh, we first picked up on it back about 10, eight to 10 years ago. So uh, these patients would be continually followed, but you know, like probably everywhere else at 20 years, there's probably a 40 to 50% recurrence rate in spite of quote, Simpson one removal. So uh, we usually followed the patient for five years, then did 18 months, 18 months, then did 24, 24, 36, 36, 48, 48, 10 years, 10 years, and stopped. I mean, most of those patients, I, I haven't been in practice that long, so I won't be following them up for that full course, but I'll try and follow them for 25 years. Dr. McDermott Sharif. Yeah. So when, when you when you take the tumor out, how does the, and you, like you, you're obviously disrupting also the venous flow, how does the endolymph eventually drain after surgery? No idea, we don't do any, we can't do any studies and we presume that uh, the symptomatic relief is because they were previously obstructed and lymphatic flow was obstructed by the tumor and when we removed it, we created a fistula. So the endolymphatic shunt was a procedure where they, the neurotologist would do it and place a tube uh, into the semicircular canals. They have to do a retrolabyrinthine um, operation. They place some kind of small tube and put it into the subarachnoid space through the dura. So I'm assuming we did the same thing with tumor removal. Okay. So is, is this a symptom like common in IIH patients because of, uh, no. because of increased pressure? No. Uh, you mean idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Yeah. Uh, those those patients are complicated, as you know. 
Um, and uh, that's one of the crosses that I bore when I was at UCSF because I decided everybody else was not looking after the hydrocephalus patients properly. Um, so, um, but th those, we wrote a review on idiopathic intracranial hypertension. It's one of the most cited uh, references for me, um, but that review is old. Things haven't changed, um, but those patients are difficult because they have a lot of psychological issues going on. They're not straight. These patients are pretty straightforward. They just have <laughs> body vestibular symptoms and that's it. Nobody can figure out why or doesn't know the, the relationship. So um, hopefully, you know, public, public, uh, getting these kind of case series published will bring to the attention of uh, neurosurgeons and neurologists that there is a reasonable option for these patients. Okay. I don't think that video surgery would be, wouldn't be as effective for obvious reasons. Yeah, uh, this is Dr. Alan Herskowitz. Uh, Mike, how do you determine when you get a referral for a vestibular schwannoma, whether you do radio surgery or whether you do oh. surgery? Well, do you have 45 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I have till nine o'clock. Yeah, well, you know, that's a different topic, but maybe for a different time. But obviously, patient factors, tumor factors. On the patient factor side, it's obviously hearing status. And on the tumor factor size, it's size. So older patients, no hearing, smaller tumors, radio surgery. Younger patients, hearing's not as relevant, but tumor size is really important. So big tumors, um, you know, we plan, we usually use microsurgery, but um, we have gone full circle. We don't try and take out the entire tumor because the morbidity related to facial nerve palsy um, you know, is extremely high. We don't, you know, I've seen the, the evolution in 30 years of uh, surgical practice. We used to be able to operate on the little ones when they grew and they were a pleasure to do. Facial nerve outcomes were great. Facial weakness, 20% at one week, 40% at two weeks, 2% at one year. So most of the patients were covered and it was not uncommon to see a delayed increase in the facial weakness, which eventually got better because the nerve was intact. But now it's most of those patients either get observed or most of them get radio surgery. And we don't um, get to operate on those anymore. We get to operate on like a five centimeter thing, which are, you know. I actually had a patient with a vestibular schwannoma referred to your group or neurosurgery a while back. Small tumor, she had radio surgery and now she has intractable dizzy vertigo, which is very incapacitating to her. And it was found sir, uh, uh, by serendipity. I did a scan on a, she had migraine. We found a vestibular schwannoma and then retrospect, she was having dizzy symptoms, not a lot of hearing loss and referred to neurosurgery. She had radio surgery and now she's got intractable vertigo. And the well, tumor was, uh, you know, still a little bit, was, was a little residual, so. Yeah, the intractable, um... Vertigo, if you, I just went through this with a patient, uh, with a dentist in the office, and the outcomes in terms of um, uh, response to um, radio surgery, observational microsurgery be, uh, with respect to tinnitus and dizziness depends on the paper you read. It's basically a coin toss. Uh, but if the patient had disabling vertigo, then there's other methods for treatment. Number one, if the patient has no useful hearing, you can do a chemical labyrinthectomy with gentamicin injection through the round window. Uh, that's been reported. It's a three injection protocol, uh, seems to work. Uh, if they have preserved useful hearing and they're truly incapacitated and the electrodiagnostic studies support that, then you can do a vestibular nerve section. Um, if the tumor is small enough, you can isolate the vestibular nerves. It's a, it, but that's an open operation. You have to do a craniotomy. So um, I will, next time I present, I'll talk about vestibular schwannomas and I will go over some of the literature, uh, use a case example from our current series, but let's move on to the next uh, case presentation. All right, can you hear me okay? All right, great. Yep. yep. Uh, my presentation, Michael, I think I've maybe seen one um, case that presented that way, and I know what to do now. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. All right, so this is, a, I'm gonna try to do this interactive. 
let's see if uh, and Ignella is going to help me hopefully with a, a poll because I don't I can't activate that from my side. So this is a patient I saw uh, earlier late last year. Um, Forty six year old left handed man, past medical history, asthma, vasovagal syncope, a couple of times a decade ago or a little bit more. Syncopal episode a few years back started when turning his head to the left. Another episode a few months prior to presentation when turning his head to the left, but this time it was associated with syncope and urinary incontinence. When turning the head to the sides, he feels a click on his neck, gets dizzy, transient difficulty speaking, lasts about three seconds. He says some hoarseness uh, that, that happens. It has been happening briefly for about, about every day, always completely resolves. He has some non-radiating left neck discomfort, maybe had some diaphoresis with one event, and he's seen a couple of cardiologists. He's gotten some cardiac electrophysiology tests, the carotid Doppler study, and all that looked okay. So with that, oh, let's see, with that, you know, these are the kind of things that I think about. Um, when, when hearing this type of case description, but I wanted to, to just get a sense from you, from the group, what, what you thought was the most likely diagnosis based on just that description. So Ignel, I don't know if you can uh, submit the poll to the group. Can you do that? Yeah, can you go back to your first slide? Okay, sure. Well, I don't think I can Paul and go back. Um, I don't know if Ignel, I can go to the poll then. Okay, all right, let me go, let me try to go back without screwing this. <laughs> I'm not, um, let me see, I think I can. Okay, there you go. Can I ask you a question? This is Robert Saxton. Hi, Robert, yes. Good to see you. Um, did he ever have any chest x-ray suggesting that he might have bilateral cervical ribs or some sort of rib anomaly in one side of the neck? That's 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 a that's a good thought. Um, I think he did. I think he did. It was not reported as such, but that's a that's a good that's a good thought as well. Okay, we ready for the poll? Yep. All right. Can you submit it again, uh, Ignella, please? All right. Thank you. So we'll just give it um, just give it a minute. I'm gonna. I think I what what's Eagle syndrome? Is Eagle a, syndrome. Eagle syndrome is an the band the from the stylomastoid from the uh, stylomastoid process down to the mm -hmm. hyoid bone. Is that the Eagle syndrome? That's right. That's okay, right. That's, what, that's what I'm voting. Okay, I think um, I think we can close it now, and uh, I'm going to show you some images. We'll actually submit it. Um, I don't know if you can share the results that. Um, no, I do know. Okay. All right. Interesting. Okay. And then when someone said other, um, I don't know if you can put that in the chat. I'm interested to to know what you know what you're thinking. Um, that'll be good for us. Okay. So I'm going to show you some pictures, and then we'll we'll um, I'll, I'll pull you again. Um, that will be the last time I'll do that. So the exam, I haven't told you the exam, vital signs are stable. His general exam is normal, really. His neurologic exam, full neural exam, the cervical rib. Okay, thank you, Dr. Saxon. The, the neuro exam was normal as well, completely normal. Um, his brain MRI, Good morning. MRA head and neck, normal non-contrasted MRI of the brain, MRA of the head within normal limits, MRA neck, no evidence of significant, significant extracranial cerebrovascular stenosis. I'm just gonna show you here a video um, just so that you can see. Um, this is his flare, brain flare sequence. And um, that, looks, that looks really good. So young adults should look, okay. CTA head and neck, um, normal CT scan, CTA neck, um, it says normal, essentially normal. We tried to do this CTA neck, and uh, Kevin tried to help me. I don't know if it was actually Kevin or 
Um, it might have been someone else that day, but trying to put the, the neck in the position where he had the symptoms and see if we can, short of doing a, a, a conventional angiogram to look for, for um, stenosis that were uh, happening with mobility of the neck, um, that looked fine. CTA head normal, CT perfusion normal. And um, the CT neck showed some, some prominent degenerative changes at C5, C6. So you had all this part of the, the CTA. And um, this is, I just want to show you this picture. Let's see if I can go. So that is um, from his CTA. Really long styloid, stylomastoid process there on the left. Oh, yep. Cervical spine MRI showed C5-6 bulging disc osteophyte with spinal cord compression, moderate to severe encroachment of the latter, which is on foramen and canal stenosis, no abnormal cord signal. C6-C7, bulging disc osteophyte and moderate to severe encroachment of the latter, which is on foramina, no spinal cord compression, malacanal stenosis, and uh, then uh, some malformation C7-C1, and that's just a, um, I'll just give you this so you can take a look at his cervical spine. Um, and a, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So there it is. Okay, so a couple of things going on. He also had some cardiac testing. Cardiac calcium score was zero. He had an EEG, which was reported as normal. Um, okay, so that with that, and this is the last time I'll pull you guys. Um, I want to see if that has changed any what you thought. Um, if Nella, could you please resend the poll for the group? So we'll just give it 30 seconds. Okay. All right. So not not much change. Well, we have double for whatever reason. We have two two eagle syndromes there, but maybe that that's a lot. That's a little bit more common. And then cervical spine stenosis um, is is also uh, less others. Okay. Um, so the answer to to the case, uh, we think it is eagle syndrome, and um, we did have. Um, uh, we did see him for a cervical spine stenosis um, uh, within the group as well. Um, and uh, it was thought that that was asymptomatic, the cervical spine stenosis. And um, the patient is actually pending surgery uh, for Eagle syndrome. So I'll, I'll report back to the group with how he's doing. But uh, this is what we think he has. So this was first described in uh, 1937 uh, with the term algia. And uh, it's an elongation of the styloid process or calcification of the styloid ligament. Normal dimension, it's up to centimeters and usually it's considered elongated when it's more than three centimeters. And it invades the maxillovertebral pharyngeal recess. And uh, some of the structures that are there, the carotid artery, internal jugular vein, and the uh, cranial nerves seven, nine, 10, and 12. The age group, 30 to 50 years old, so this patient goes right into that age group, but it has also been described in, in children. Uh, symptoms that you can see, and I've seen a few, mostly with stroke, um, but this patient didn't have a stroke, which, which also um, you know, was, a, was a little of a curveball because we're, we're not used to maybe seeing some of these complaints. But you have some vague cervicofacial pain, you can have some otologia, sore throat, some of the inophagia, facial pain, headache, pain on cervical rotation can be exacerbated by swallowing, chewing, opening the jaw. You can have the foreign body sensation in the pharynx. Um, you can have vertigo and dizziness as part of it, hypoacusis and hyperacusis. Yeah, syncope with Johnny, as uh, Michael is uh, putting there on the chat, throat discomfort. But then symptoms typically worsen uh, by head turning. And stroke is, is one of the most feared complications, which you know, I would say I've seen just maybe like two or so. I haven't seen that many from this. 
And the proposed mechanism is mechanical for the most part, be that compression of the neural structures by the elongated styloid process, uh, irritation of the pharyngeal mucosa. Many times there's fracture of the ligament. So some people will say they were on some form of contact sports, had a, a mild, moderate um, trauma to the uh, head and neck, and then they started uh, uh, complaining of, of uh, these symptoms, and it's because that elongated process ruptured and then started getting into contact with the structures. Uh, part of it can be irritation of the sympathetic nerve around the arterial sheath or stretching uh, uh, of, the, of the nerves. So there's two reported types, vascular type and classic type. The vascular type uh, mostly related to the carotid artery syndrome, not related to previous pharyngeal surgery, and um, there's impingement of the carotid arteries. In this case, we didn't actually see impingement of the carotid vessels on the CTA or the MRI for that part. And the classic type that is that generally occurs mainly after traumatic events of this styloid process, and it's typically encountered in patients following tonsillectomy or minor trauma to the neck region. So some of the other things in the differential diagnosis that we, well, we mentioned earlier, um, neurologists, sometimes we think about migraine type headaches, temporomandibular joint disease. Um, uh, so it's some, some, some of the things that we need to consider as well. And on the exam, sometimes you can feel um, it, 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 something occupying the tonsillar fossa, compression of the, the, that area, Sometimes can reproduce symptoms, and there can also be pain relief after local anesthesia in the inferior aspect of the tonsillar fossa. I don't know about putting a needle with all those structures in the area, but um, I guess some people some people can do that. Diagnostic imaging CT is the ideal test, uh, and then vascular imaging is required for the differential diagnosis. So you can see in in uh, there on the presentation how it can look. I mean that's a very long calcified ligament, of course, um, that we could see it on our MRI as well, uh, like uh, Dr. Um, like Michael uh, pointed out uh, when we were doing, when we were looking at that CTA, you could see the process being elongated and calcified left, right, which is where he has uh, uh, the symptom. Well, treatment can be conservative, uh, depending on what the symptoms are and how severe they are, but, but some patients ultimately need surgery and the surgery can be done transorally or transcervical. Uh, and you can do a partial or complete styloidectomy that usually takes care of the symptoms. And that's, that's all I had. I don't know if you had any questions or comments on, on this case. I like the differential of the cervical rib. We have seen a, a couple of patients um, with, with that one with very severe recurrent strokes as well. So I think this is something that might go under the radar um, if we're not looking for, for it. That, that was great. It's Kevin, if you don't mind me asking uh, a question on it. Uh, in this particular patient, what do you think the mechanism of the syncope was? Yeah, I think there could be, there could be different ones. One is that he did have episodes of syncope dating back for a while. And I don't know if, if it's, again, cases of this has been described even in children. So... I am not sure if, um, if part of this is just uh, irritability or mechanical regarding the, the, the carotid. I mean, it's, it's above the bifurcation that shouldn't affect, which shouldn't be related to sinus um, hyperactivity. But um, I don't know if it's a combination of, of some personal predisposition plus, plus that, um, but it could also just be, just be irritability and, and uh, uh, mechanical as well, I, I would think. Yeah, and this is also something that we see a lot on imaging, and most people don't, you know, have symptoms from it. Um, so it's sort of like what this first case Mike showed, where we see a lot of, you know, Peter's face meningiomas, and, you know, only a small percentage of them have the vertigo. And uh, whereas with this, you know, we see the elongated style of hired processes a lot, and thankfully most of the patients aren't symptomatic. Actually, I just saw one yesterday, they actually protruded into the uh, into the uh, lower margin of the oral pharynx at the level of the uh, tip of the epiglottis, but that person was symptomatic. They have uh, you know pain um, 
on swallowing. So great. Yeah, case. so I, I didn't I didn't write it here, Kevin. I was looking for it on the slides, but what I found um, that was reported is four percent of the population has has an elongated process by that definition. And about four percent of those have actually have symptoms. So it is considered somewhat of a rare, rare um, disease. So Felipe, it would be interesting only academically to get an MRA with the positioning of the head in a variety of different forms so that one could assess whether there's actually a stretch on the carotid itself through some sort of fibrous uh, you know, banding or some other po possibility that would ultimately affect the bulb. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great, that's a great, and we try, you know, we try doing the CTA. So we tried to do the CTA with the patient's head turned to the left, which is what we did. Um, in our at Baptist, he went for, for the CTA at Baptist. It didn't really show anything. I think Sharif actually might have might have read that that study. Uh, it didn't really show any 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 indentation. Um, but uh, um, like you know, we we I guess the best ideal the gold standard would be to do a conventional cerebral DSA, but we didn't want to do an invasive test um, in his situation. Which uh, specialty uh, here operates on these? Uh, since this is a fixed anatomical deficit, uh, what does conservative therapy consist of? Because you kind of have to prove the symptoms are due to this to recommend surgery, and it seems to be indirect means. But how do you give conservative therapy to this if this is the cause and it's a fixed lesion? Yeah, I mean, for some people, I think it's, inf it, it's just a little bit of inflammation. It doesn't bother them too much. Um, but, uh, uh, but you're right. I mean, some people do the, the local anesthesia, uh, anesthesia on, on that process. Um, and if that improves this, the symptoms, then, um, then they consider surgery for those groups. But, but there's others, like you're saying, it is just a fixed thing and you won't really be completely hundred percent sure until you've taken care of it and the patient improves. Yeah, I think one thing that is important, Felipe, and I, I've seen a couple of patients actually with ego syndrome in the office. Um, the one actually as recent as last week, I think, I don't know if Dr. Tochin is, is on the call, but yes, he, I'm on the call and I sent that patient to you. I was going to chime in right, as well. Right. Exactly. So that, that's a patient that has, um, you know, a lot of symptoms. It, it's very tricky because, you know, it, it, that patient specifically has so many symptoms. It's hard to make sure, or it's hard to correlate them all with a possible ego syndrome. But the question really becomes, you know, what is... I mean, this is really an exclusion diagnosis. You know, this patient can have other problems that are potentially more serious than that, that they need to go a full workup. Um, and, and just to, to comment one thing, I mean, I, I published a paper a few years ago, actually probably like 15 years ago about a bow hunter syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that's something that potentially, you know, because the question is, this patient most interesting complaint is syncope and dizziness, right? He actually, he's most in this particular case, his most most complaint is that when he turns his head, he feels this pressure, this like singing on his throat, um, that the hoarseness and the difficulty, like, you know, speaking clearly. Um, but he's had syncope a couple of times, not not all the time, but he has had um, um, some episodes of syncope associated with it too. Right, but don't you, I mean, would you agree that if he does have syncope and that's an important symptom, I mean, the, the, the ego syndrome most likely is involving, you know, really compression or stenosis or whatever you want to call like rotational stenosis of the internal carotid, right? I don't know, or, or, or by some, some means it's just impinging on it and you know, irritating it and causing some, you know, sympathetic maybe reaction, yeah, um, uh, he, he does have some diaphoresis and things like that with, with a couple of them. I, I think it's- Almost like a big reason. Yeah, I think mechanical is, is, is one way. Uh, it doesn't seem like in this case that is, I mean, we did do the CTA with his head turn. We didn't, he didn't wanna try the conventional DSA. Um, um, you know, he was a little afraid of that. Um, but I agree that that's another differential. It, I mean, it has to be. It has to be explored. His his verts were uh, really good. His vertebral arteries were were um, looked really clean on the study. Even though he has cervical uh, disease, right? He has cervical stenosis, and he has some some impingement also uh, uh, on the sides, on the on the uh, 
exiting nerve roots, but it didn't seem to affect um, the vertebral arteries. I don't know if Sharif's on the call too. He, he might remember the case uh, a little bit as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm listening. Uh, you're absolutely correct. The verts were perfect. And we did the uh, rotation to the side that gives them the symptoms, the vert and the carotid were fine. Philippe, uh, great presentation. Um, it's Ron Tolchin. Um, you know, the one that uh, Guillerme was talking about was a complicated case. This gentleman had a number of symptoms and it took a while for him to get diagnosed and he's seen a number of people. Um, I would say also, I, I don't believe in your presentation on the CT scan, you mentioned the stylohyloid elongation. Um, and my point to that is, and maybe you left it, I don't know if you put that in on the first couple slides, but my point is that it gets missed sometimes, not by Kevin and not by Margaret, <laughs> but it gets missed uh, a, a number of times and you have to do a lot of times the CT to really see it. Um, certainly I could see it here on this one, but did you, in the report that you mentioned in your presentation, I don't know if you mentioned stylohyloid, maybe you left it out to throw us off for a little bit or- make No, us... no, no, it was not mentioned. It right. was not mentioned. Yeah, and that's um, my point. Um, right. It doesn't get mentioned. You have to kind of put, in your uh, request for the CT that you're thinking about uh, Eagle syndrome. And there are a number of patients, I've had a number of patients with this and present with neck pain and some of the symptoms as well. Um, and um, the, uh, the other thing is that uh, I had a patient that had it resected and was you know, totally resolved all of her symptoms. And she's like leading a chat group now, a support group for this, for people that don't know that they might have this or they have diagnosed it, but no one really knows what to do and they're not readily doing surgery on it. So it's an interesting group of patients uh, and they get written off as, um, you know, symptom magnification type of patients, but they really do have severe symptoms in many cases. Absolutely. I think it's under-recognized. Um, but on, on the flip side, the vast majority, you know, like we said, only about maybe 4% or so seem to have symptoms, even if they have an elongated process. So um, and this is something that, I don't know, I mean, Kevin or, or Trey, if you want to, you might want to, or Margaret, want to yeah. talk about, but it's something that they see, I think, rather uh, somewhat frequently. And then most of the time it's not symptomatic, but I agree. It's, 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 if you have the suspicion, you, I think you need to put that in the description will help. Absolutely. I, 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 after the conference, I'll send a case that I sent to our like neuroradiology group yesterday, which is the biggest styloid, stylohyoid ligament I've seen. It's ossified all the way to the insertion and the diameter was almost a centimeter and the patient was asymptomatic. So if we start mentioning them on, on every patient, it will just create, uh, you know, particularly patients who come from the ER where, you know, tests are done nonstop. Unless there is a high clinical suspicion for that, it becomes, you know, counterintuitive to mention them on every yeah. case. Yeah, I agree, Sharif. That kind of reminds me of flow velocities in the aqueduct. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. It was a great discussion. Thank you. Yeah, so let's um, we got well, let's take an eight minute break and we'll reconvene for Rupesh Kotecha who will be talking about radio surgery. Um, so you get a seven eight minute coffee break. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. Um, for some reason, my Rupesh is Robert texting. Let me just interject for one second. What's conspicuously missing from that slide is any discussion of immunotherapy. Um, can you comment on that? Sure. So in systemic therapy alone, you know, traditionally cytotoxic chemotherapy was not used given the poor intracranial penetration. But really, when we think about systemic therapy alone, that is actually either immunotherapy or, for example, targeted therapy for patients who have ALK-rearranged non-small cell lung cancer or EGFR mutated disease or melanoma brain metastasis that have a BRAF alteration. So those are the patients who are receiving systemic therapy, and, and a large proportion of those are immunotherapy patients. Super. Now, classically or historically, the treatment for all patients who develop brain metastasis was whole brain radiation therapy. This is just a side portal of what that looks like. So again, it's essentially one beam from the left, one beam from the right. It treats the whole brain um, with radiation, really with an equivalent dose throughout. And historically, this was really used for all patients who develop brain metastasis. Um, although we know when we see patients, we can essentially categorize them in unfavorable or favorable. So again, I gave you that laundry list of features that we think about, but again, unfavorable would be maybe poor performance status, 
continuing progressive extracranial disease, large volume and number of intracranial metastasis. And then favorable patients have all the opposite features, but everybody used to get the same treatment. Now, I personally actually love the historical studies from the Brain Tumor Study Group, as well as from the RTOG. Uh, it's actually one of the things that really drew me to radiation oncology as a field, and that the studies were very methodical, well thought out. And something that we do in radiation oncology is we test every single regimen that we use in patients. And so, for example, this is historically the types of studies that used to be done, which is we'd take patients who needed whole brain radiation therapy, and they were out to get 30 gray in two weeks, 30 gray in three weeks, 40 gray in three weeks, 40 gray in four weeks, a follow-up study could be 20 grain one week, um, 30 grain two weeks, 40 grain three weeks. And so essentially we would test every single regimen. And these were very easy to do with regards from a radiation oncology standpoint, they made sense and they really just dealt with radiation therapy. Now in the modern era, it's very complicated for us to do trials. We're thinking about sequencing systemic therapy and stereotactic radiosurgery, radiosurgery and hippocampal spraying whole brain, selecting out patient populations at initial diagnosis or relapse disease. It's a very complicated space. And I like to think about what historically, what the trials were very straightforward. But we moved away from standard whole brain radiation therapy uh, for patients really uh, without stratifying between favorable and unfavorable because of the neurocognitive side effects that were associated with standard whole brain radiation therapy. This is a lot of research that Dr. Mehta and our department had done over a number of years to really show this and then develop alternative strategies. Now today we are gonna talk about specifically stereotactic radiosurgery, which has really um, been used more commonly in patients who are at the more favorable of this spectrum. Um, but obviously hippocampal avoidance whole brain radiation therapy is another option that we've been using for an increasing number of patients at our facility as well. But today we're gonna focus on radiosurgery. Now there are many advantages to the use of primary stereotactic radiosurgery. So that's at initial diagnosis and as a standalone treatment for patients who develop brain metastasis. I've kind of listed them all here just to make it as a summary slide, but essentially it's been shown to be an effective local therapy, even for patients who have radio resistant disease. So some diagnoses and histologies, for example, melanoma, renal cell carcinoma, if you look at the control rates with traditional whole brain radiation therapy, they're about 30 to 40%. If you look at radio surgery series, you see a control rate of at least 85%. It can be used to target surgically inaccessible areas of the brain. It can be associated with a shorter recovery time than for example, patients undergoing resection. It can be used for patients who had limited disease. And that's where we actually have randomized trials comparing radiosurgery and whole brain. And that really is between three to four lesions. But we're having increasing evidence for patients who have multiple brain metastasis. Actually, this year at Astro, we have some initial data that is due to be published looking at radiosurgery versus whole brain for patients who have at least five lesions. It can be performed in between treatment cycles for patients receiving standard cytotoxic chemotherapy regimens, or even quickly prior to initiation of treatment. You know, patients are diagnosed with brain mets on a screening MRI. We've often already treated them with gamma knife before they've even had a port placed in starting their chemotherapy. It's uh, safe and effective for patients who develop metachronous brain metastases. Specify here that I wrote metachronous, so not retreatments. That's a completely different scenario, higher risk of toxicity. Um, it does help to maintain the quality of life and leads to less neurocognitive deterioration compared to standard whole brain radiation therapy, a question of now radiosurgery versus hippocampal sparing whole brain radiation therapy is really up for debate and randomized trials are being done in this space right now. And there may be a synergistic benefit to the use of radiosurgery in patients receiving targeted therapy or immunotherapies. I'll touch a little bit about this, about targeted therapies here. And as I mentioned, we did talk about the combination of immunotherapy and radiosurgery at the Miami Brain Meeting. So at our facility, about 85% of patients um, who receive stereotactic radiosurgery are actually treated for brain metastases. So our benign tumor population is actually makes up a very small proportion of patients that we treat. This is a list of all of the indications that we use radiosurgery for patients who have brain metastasis at our facility. And really to divide it up, I think these are the traditional uh, reasons to use it for patients who have limited disease, for example, fewer than four lesions, those who have multiple lesions. So those are basically typically between four and 10 lesions. And then for patients who have recurrent brain metastases after prior therapy. So I think these are really not controversial. Patients who have had whole brain, relapse, really radiosurgery is used for those patients and has been used for a number of years. 
Now, the current indications that most uh, facilities with a radiosurgery program uh, use are potentially introduction of fractionation for larger lesions. I'll show you some data on that. Um, there's some more innovative treatments called staged stereotactic radiosurgery uh, for those who have larger lesions. I'll actually show an example of that. Uh, Preoperative radiosurgery and postoperative radiosurgery are evol evolving areas of evidence development. And then these are kind of the newer indications. So sometimes we boost lesions that have had poor response to whole brain radiation therapy. Again, those with a radio resistant histology, maybe those that don't have um, systemic therapy that has good CNS penetration. Uh, we've used it actually to reduce the bulk of leptomeningeal disease in patients who are undergoing intrathecal systemic therapy or really to get them to intrathecal systemic therapy. And then patients who have uh, lesions outside the brain, but still within the target areas for uh, radiosurgery, we can also use that for. Now, in general, for patients with a single brain metastasis, stereotactic radiosurgery, like surgery, improves not only local control, but also overall survival. And we know this from randomized trials that have been performed in this space. As you can see pictured here, the use of stereotactic radiosurgery, in addition to whole brain radiation therapy, reduced the local failure rate, as well as improved the survival from five to six and a half months. Now, for patients who have multiple lesions, radiosurgery has been sh in shown to improve local control, as well as improve functional independence and reduce steroid requirements, not overall survival. Now, primary stereotactic radiosurgery alone at initial diagnosis of brain metastasis for patients who have multiple lesions, and this has been certified at least by the NCCN as more than three lesions, has been used. As you can see here, this is the NCCN guidelines from the end of last year. It's actually been updated now this year as well, which shows the same. Whole brain radiation therapy or radiosurgery can be used for patients who have multiple lesions. That change happened actually historically in 2014. As you can see here, I pulled the original recommendation and it said the panel has recently added radiosurgery as a primary treatment option for patients who have multiple lesions. And then by 2016, they actually refined that language to say that all patients diagnosed with more than three lesions should be treated with whole brain or radiosurgery as primary therapies. So they could be both used and we are increasingly using radiosurgery um, even for patients who have multiple brain metastases. So with the increasing use of primary SRS as upfront therapy and as a sole treatment modality, this kind of leads us to five questions. And we'll go through this in more detail. The first is, well, what are the outcomes when you treat patients with primary radiosurgery and you leave out the whole brain radiation therapy component? Well, actually, the first multi-institutional study from this actually was put together um, by UCSF and Cleveland Clinic. Um, it was 10 institutions, 569 patients. Um, as you can see here, looking at the different RPA classes, and again, this is a retrospective review, but essentially there was no significant differences observed with survival. When you're looking at the patients who received serotactic radiosurgery alone or serotactic radiosurgery and whole brain radiation therapy. And so the authors here concluded that at least this did not appear to negatively affect a patient's survival. But sometimes it's not just about survival that we're affecting patients. This is actually an initial report that Dr. Mehta had actually put together um, showing that it's not just survival, there are also other issues in that patients who receive radiosurgery alone have a higher risk of any brain failure, which is really uh, generated by distant brain failure rates in this patient population. I've since adapted this table and added some additional evidence to this space, but you can see here the risk of distant brain failure is still about 30 to 64% in this patient population. This requires additional imaging in these patients, additional surveillance, and then potentially additional salvage therapies. So with that segue, so is primary stereotactic radiosurgery then gonna be more costly than radiosurgery and whole brain radiation therapy, specifically because of the distant failure rates? So I put together some data on this, um, looking at upfront radiosurgery patients compared to patients who received radiosurgery and whole brain radiation therapy. Unfortunately, most of these patients were treated on these randomized trials in which they received the combination treatment, or that was really the standard of care at that time. We collected the costs from regards to encounters, procedures, and imaging, and then re-estimated those costs from a pair of perspective uh, Medicare, and then calculated kind of three costs, the cumulative cancer-specific costs, the brain metastasis-specific costs, and the cumulative total cost to healthcare.
Now, the first thing I want to show you with this data is that if you look at the 12-month distant failure rate, you can see for the second column of patients, those are treated with stereotactic radiosurgery alone, about 50% of them actually had new brain metastases. This is compared to patients who received whole brain radiation therapy at initial onset, which is essentially halved at about 23%. Now for salvage treatments, you can see that essentially half of the patients received salvage whole brain, and then half of the patients ended up receiving salvage stereotactic radiosurgery. So there is additional treatments that these patients will need and undergo. But if you start calculating all their brain metastasis specific costs, they end up being very similar as you can see here. Their cancer specific costs, again, this becomes more of a wash. And if you look at their total cost of healthcare, and then this ends up not becoming, contributing significantly to the entire system. And actually, if you look at the per patient cost and you look plot it longitudinally over time, you can see that for the patients that are gonna live long enough, for those, for example, at 12 months, you start to have an increase in cost with primary stereotactic radiosurgery because of the need for additional imaging as well as for the additional treatments. And that then starts to exceed really at the 12 month and then obviously for the patients who are long-term survivors, you see that cost differential that increases as well significantly. But again, for the patients who are gonna be those long-term survivors, we have to really think about, is that worth it if we can give them radiosurgery alone and then not uh, can avoid some of the neurocognitive side effects associated with treatment. This has also been looked at um, by the MD Anderson group. This was a randomized trial here on the left in which patients were randomized to receive stereotactic radio surgery or stereotactic radio surgery and whole brain radiation therapy. And essentially those are the plots of the Hopkins verbal learning test total recall, which is one of the neurocognitive tests that was significantly different between these two patient populations. And when they took that data and then looked at the cost effectiveness, they came out, you can see here in about the 40,000 range. And again, the ICER for you know, uh, treatments that are considered or interventions that are considered cost effective is actually typically about 50 to 100,000. So in this study as well, um, radio surgery and observation, so no whole brain radiation therapy was uh, thought to be cost effective. So now if we're gonna approach these patients with multiple brain metastasis, um, with upfront primary stereotactic radio surgery, we've gotten over the cost question, uh, what are the outcomes for these patients when you treat them for multiple lesions? Well, first of all is, can the technology do it? What's our really upper limit for how many lesions? Is it five? Is it 10? Is it 15? Well, from a physics standpoint with the technology that we have in the department, if I wanted to calculate, for example, what we would give, that would be an equivalent dose to essentially giving whole brain radiation therapy, Essentially, this is actually calculated with our gamma knife platform. We could treat 177 lesions that were less than four millimeters in size, about seven lesions that were between two and a half to three and a half uh, centimeters, or 40 lesions that were of kind of mixed sizes in between these. Now, this is not our recommendation from Dr. McDermott or myself in our radio surgery program to treat 170 lesions uh, in patients with radio surgery, but from a technology standpoint, our technology is really allowing us to treat patients who have multiple brain metastases more commonly. So really the question is, if we treat patients with multiple brain metastases, what are their outcomes with regards to survival? And so this is a retrospective study that we put together, um, again, at Cleveland Clinic before, looking at the survival for patients who had been treated to more than five lesions. So this was kind of more controversial at that time. And essentially we saw this stratification that patients who were treated at eight or more ended up having a lower survival compared to patients who were treated or, or than eight or fewer lesions. And so essentially it became kind of our standard that we moved the threshold early on um, to make eight kind of our threshold or cutoff uh, for patients who could receive stereotactic radio surgery for multiple brain metastases. So about two years after that initial publication, the Japanese group actually published their consortium analysis. These are about 1200 patients enrolled on a prospective registry with multiple brain metastasis, as in up to 10 lesions, treated with primary stereotactic radio surgery alone. And in this series, they showed that the survival was better if you had a single lesion, but there was no difference in survival for patients who had between two to four or five to 10 lesions. So essentially this uh, added data to treat patients up to 10 lesions with primary stereotactic radio surgery. Now again, this is published in 2014. By 2017 at ASCO, actually Dr. Mimi Alawai and I put together a series of now 6,000 patients essentially treated for 
uh, brain metastasis with stereotactic radiosurgery, so about four times the series uh, from the Japanese group. And as you can see here, if you have enough patients, you can see that there are clearly differences in survival for these patients, even between one, two to four, five to 10, or more than 10. Now, again, the more than 10 basically overlaps the five to 10, but between, between one and 10 lesions, you can see there are differences for these patients. Now, the Japanese group did stratify patients. They selected only patients with a certain lesion size and a certain performance status. And if you start to match basically their series, we still get with about 2000 patients or so, um, some stratification, although less across these different subgroups. So that question is still up in the air. And again, we're having randomized trials in this area that are gonna develop evidence for the treatment of multiple brain metastases. But I did wanna to touch in this space about how tumor biology may impact this. This is actually a specific study that we looked at for non-small cell lung cancer brain metastases patients. And we looked at the patients who only had ALK rearranged and EGFR mutations versus the patients who are wild type for all of these alterations. So essentially that gave us a series of about 300 patients. And we looked at if you have increasing lesions now in patients who have access to targeted therapies with intracranial penetration, does the number of brain metastases actually matter at that point? And as you can see here, actually the number of brain metastases does not impact survival. In fact, the curve is actually going the opposite direction. For those who had more than three lesions, their survival was actually 24 months as a median survival. But for patients who had wild type non-small cell lung cancer, we did see that their survival dropped with increasing number of lesions. So I think for these specific patient populations, we are learning that the number of brain mets alone does not actually impact overall survival. I think we need additional work to be done in these subpopulations and not just classify all patients just with a certain diagnosis together. So as I'd mentioned, one of the issues with radiosurgery alone in the upfront setting is not just the survival question, but really the risk of distant intracranial failure. So are there ways that we can predict the patients that will suffer that distant cranial failure? And maybe those are the patients that we select out and we give them whole brain radiation therapy, either instead of radiosurgery or as an additional approach. So this is a multi-institutional distant brain failure nomogram that was created that we contributed to do. It's about 3000 patients now from eight very busy radiosurgery uh, centers. And as you can see here, the cumulative incidence of distant intracranial failure, this is actually what we see now in the modern era. At six months, about 25% of patients. At 12 months, it's about 35. And then at 24 months, it's 45. So when patients ask us in the clinic, well, what's the risk of developing new lesions in the future? I think these are very easy numbers to remember, again, from a very large series. And very interestingly enough, again, we contributed patients to this series, but what we saw is there was a clear difference or stratification when you had patients who had more than eight lesions compared to less than eight lesions. And that's both if you look at the incidence of distant intracranial failure, as well as if you look at the need for salvage whole brain radiation therapy, which is actually a specific endpoint. This is at the point that you decide to pull the trigger and say, okay, this patient needs whole brain radiation. So Again, as I mentioned in the initial analysis that we had put together between Cleveland and UCSF, that eight lesions kind of stood out. And then now eight lesions in a large series also is kind of that clear cut point that we should think about not offering um, primary stereotactic radiosurgery alone. So essentially this is the conclusion that you know I take away from, from this study is eight or fewer lesions, you can offer primary stereotactic radiosurgery. But we're having some increasing evidence development in this space as well. So instead of just thinking about the number of new lesions, there is a concept called brain metastasis velocity that has been developed, which is essentially the risk of developing new lesions over a certain period of time. And some patients are developing new lesions essentially at every scan that we're scanning them at. And some patients take years to develop a new lesion. For example, I just saw a patient who we treated and when I got here back in 2017, who has now just developed new intracranial lesions. That patient has a very slow brain metastasis velocity. And so this is a multi-institutional validation, uh, again, 3,000 patients that we contributed to now, that shows that patients who have a slow brain metastasis velocity, their survival is actually very good and they have a low risk of neurologic death. And so maybe those are patients we should consider repeat serotactic radiosurgery.
On the other hand, you have patients who have rapid brain metastasis velocity, imagine more than 13. So they're developing new lesions every time you scan them. Well, those are patients that we really triage towards whole brain radiation therapy. And now there actually is gonna be a randomized trial, which is going to be opening very soon at our institution, which is actually gonna be randomizing these patients uh, between radiosurgery and whole brain radiation therapy. And then finally, as I mentioned, well, if they develop lesions in the future, can we do repeat radiosurgery? Again, for metachronous brain metastasis, we have some evidence in this space. Now, normally if patients develop new lesions once or twice, they just automatically get radiosurgery alone. Now we obviously have the brain metastasis velocity to help us stratify patients better. But what are the outcomes when you have a heavily treated population with radiosurgery? So I put this series together of patients who had at least three courses of stereotactic radiosurgery. So not one, not two, but only patients who had at least three. So very heavily treated patient population. So 59 patients treated to, uh, again, a median of three, but anywhere from three to eight courses of stereotactic radiosurgery for a total of 765 brain metastases, again, in 59 patients. And here you can see the total number of lesions that were treated essentially at each of the uh, radiosurgery courses. Now, the overall survival for this patient population is modest at 71% at 12 months. Um, but interestingly enough, only 24 patients or 41% actually had a decline in their KPS at their last office visit. And we had actually a preservation of quality of life. And I'll show you these outcomes. So we collected prospective EQ5D um, quality of life metrics in these patients. These are patient reported outcomes for these patients. And as you can see here, whether you have three or four sessions or even more than four sessions, at least repeat radiosurgery for these patients um, allowed them to maintain their quality of life during this period of time. So that gives us at least some evidence, again, um, that radiosurgery can be used for multiple courses. Again, there is some modest treatment-related toxicity. The radiation necrosis rate um, in this patient population is about 17%. So again, much higher than we think about with just one course of radiosurgery, but at least we didn't negatively affect the patient's performance status, and we at least preserved their quality of life during this period of time. Now, radiosurgery doesn't come for free. Now, the chief dose-limiting toxicity, again, with radiosurgery, high-dose radiation, is radiation necrosis. Now, this typically occurs in about 5 to 10% of all treatments. This is um, Phil's, Dr. Adia, and Dr. Moeller's clinic uh, with a ton of patients because this may lead to worsened neurologic deficits. It increases the frequency and the cost of imaging for patients. It may necessitate prolonged treatment with corticosteroids or maybe antiogenic agents. And so this is something that we have to take very um, seriously when we treat patients with stereotactic radiosurgery. Now, across series, the uh, factor or feature that is really associated best with development of radiation necrosis is lesion size. So this is um, probably about 7,000 lesions that we treated with stereotactic radiosurgery. And as you can see here, if we plot the lesion size um, and the risk of developing radiation necrosis, it's obviously highest for the lesions that are the largest in size. Again, these are all patients treated with single fraction stereotactic radiosurgery. Not only is radiation necrosis itself an issue for us, but really diagnosing it is a challenge for us in the clinic. This is very difficult and, and typically each institution has its own institutional algorithm for actually putting patients through an imaging triage pathway, a treatment triage pathway. And actually the two centers that have actually published their own institutional algorithms and patients going through that algorithms haven't actually shown great outcomes. So this is the Yale experience on the top. So 23 patients who had an increase in size on MRI and suspicious findings on PET-CT or had an MR spectroscopy, all discussed at their institutional tumor conference, all went through their institutional algorithm. And at the end of the day, all of these patients went to surgery. 22 out of 23 of those patients, 96% had treatment effect without confirmation of active tumor. This is 23 patients that went through all of the process to confirm malignancy before going to surgery. Um, our experience at the Cleveland Clinic is a little bit better, but really not great. So 67 patients, lesions that increased in size, multidisciplinary review, advanced imaging, they all underwent PET-CT, MR spectroscopy, all were discussed, went through our triage pathway. 60% had tumor progression, 28% had necrosis only, 11% were mixed, and 2%, despite having pathology, were indeterminate. 
So clearly we need additional work in this space. There are novel PET imaging agents um, that are being developed and being used at our cancer center. I listed here two clinical trials that we are participating in. We actually had the first patient who was scanned, uh, went through this pathway. So this is a patient who received radiosurgery, surgery, uh, whole brain radiation therapy, continues to have some areas that now we have no idea what is going on. Uh, spectroscopy, perfusion are, are both mixed, but essentially you can see this lesion right up below. And you can see what this pet aximan scan, this patient was enrolled onto the clinical, clinical trial looks like. That patient just went to surgery and this is the image that the pathologist actually texted me uh, about two days ago. So this is confirmed um, tumor recurrence only. So I think hopefully we will do additional studies in this space, have additional imaging agents to really diagnose this condition. And then we can work on the treatment part as well, which is another area of uh, conundrum. So now we're gonna move on to talk about the impact of tumor biology on treatment outcome as well as toxicity. So this is the diagnosis specific GPA. So as we think about survival for patients using the original GPA stratification criteria, we know that not all brain metastasis patients act the same. And really, if you tease out the tumor biology or the histology alone, you see stark differences. For example, look at the outcomes for breast cancer patients with brain metastasis compared to patients who have GI cancers. And we are actually doing additional work in this space. Uh, one of our research fellows is gonna be working on excuse me, helping to update some data um, to help further refine these stratification criteria. But again, those are based on the initial diagnosis of a brain metastasis and their initial pathology. But we have also seen that patients actually can have a different biology in the brain metastasis compared to their primary disease. This actually has been generated uh, significantly in Boston. And essentially what they've found when they molecularly profiled the next generation sequencing of these tumors, that about 50% of brain mets actually have actual mutations that were actually not detected in the primary tumor. And also the extracranial metastatic sites actually were not reliable genomic surrogates for whatever alterations that we actually ended up seeing in the brain metastasis. So I think we have initial work to be done in this area to really identify means of diagnosing what the molecular profile may be in the brain metastasis itself. And that will help us identify what treatments that we need to target those areas of uh, disease. But for this talk and really to focus on radiosurgery, um, I kind of pulled examples um, from non-small cell melanoma, breast cancer, and renal cell. So I'm just going to do one example from each of these and hopefully show and highlight a different aspect of radiosurgery. So the first is to look at non-small cell lung cancer patients, and let's look at the influence of EGFR and ALK rearrangement on patient outcome. I gave you a hint of some of the outcomes that we saw with regards to the number of lesions and survival for patients. But in the radiosurgery space, we've also seen some differences in patient outcomes as a response to treatment. Here are two patients, one who is EGFR wild type. You can see here a small right temporal lesion treated with single fraction serotactic radiosurgery. Obviously, that didn't work. That patient had an increasing lesion size, ended up going undergoing resection, complete tumor recurrence. I will contrast this with a patient on the opposite side of the brain who is an EGFR mutation, received serotactic radiosurgery. Again, this is a larger lesion treated to the same dose. The local control should be worse, but you can see here complete response in that patient as well. So there's a difference here, in, and this is actually before the advent of uh, pen, CNS penetrating targeted agents, as you can see here from the year. So there's a difference in how these tumors may react and how patients may do. So we looked at our data um, of about 2,000 patients, 6,000 lesions um, treated over this time period. And essentially what we did is we just stratified them by the histology up front. So you can see here, adenocarcinoma patients are doing better than squamous cell carcinoma patients. And you have patients who had mixed histology kind of right in between. But then I wanted to tease out those patients who had um, EGFR and ALK rearrangement. So I worked with um, a medical student at that time who then uh, basically calculated all the EGFR and the survivals for all the EGFR and ALK rearranged patients. And if you look at their survivals and plot this across time, you can see that patients who have these alterations are living significantly longer than those patients who do not have those who are wild type and then untested is kind of right in between. So you saw the original GPA that we had presented. Let's refine that GPA by adding EGFR and ALK rearrangement status into that prognostic 
uh, classification system. And if you do that here, you can see that basically having an EGFR mutation or ALK rearrangement essentially buys you a very high um, point. So essentially that's the same. Having an ALK rearrangement is the same as essentially being asymptomatic when you're diagnosed with brain metastasis. So that's point number one. Number two is look at the survival for these patients. You're, this is numbers of years actually afterwards. Now, if you take the original diagnosis specific GPA for this population of patients, they stratify very well. As you can see here, for those patients who have a GPA at the highest GPA score, so again, 3.5 to 4, this is going to be in between, less, and then less. But then if you take those same patients and now I add their mutational profile into the GPA, you can see that these curves are better stratified. You have a better ability to estimate that patient's prognosis with regards to the brain metastasis with knowledge of their mutational profile and adding that into this. Okay, so the next example I'm going to use is melanoma to show the influence of BRAF status and systemic therapy on lesion outcome. So this is a series of patients that I put together for melanoma brain metastasis. And again, we had a small uh, proportion out of this larger data set who actually had their BRAF status known, either BRAF uh, mutated or they were BRAF wild type. And this is, as you can see here, the cumulative incidence of local failure after stereotactic radiosurgery. And you can see here that there's differences in the response rates for these patients. This is not only an influence of potentially the tumor biology, but also you can see the use of systemic therapy in these patients as well. Again, the patients who received uh, BRAF inhibition, we essentially only had one failure in this patient population. Again, about 800 or so uh, brain mets in total. Again, 80 uh, who had uh, uh, BRAF inhibition. And again, CTLA-4 inhibitors or PD-1 inhibitors also had a uh, small effect as well in this patient population. Um, we did not actually see any increased risk of radiation necrosis in these patients who were receiving these uh, targeted therapies that had CNS uh, penetration. As you can see here for the BRAF inhibition patients, we actually didn't have a single case of uh, radiation necrosis in that patient subset. On that topic and really transitioning to about the timing concept, I'm gonna use the breast cancer brain mets as an example of how we can combine our knowledge of molecular profile, move that forward with regards to systemic therapy that has intracranial penetration and time that with radiosurgery to potentially improve our management of these patients. So this is a series that we put together of breast cancer brain metastasis, like in about 3000 lesions, 550 patients who underwent uh, whole brain radiation therapy or radiosurgery about 864 patients, uh, 864 lesions were treated with radiosurgery. And if you pull out that subset alone, this is the local failure rate at one year for this patient population. So again, stratified by their uh, molecular subtype, the HER2 patient population actually had a very high risk of local failure. These numbers are actually the same as what we think about for early stage breast cancer treated with lumpectomy and radiation. We saw higher rates of failure in luminal B and HER2 subtypes and even a little bit higher in the basal subtype compared to those who had luminal A. But obviously with the advent of trastuzumab, these numbers have actually changed significantly. Well, let's think about it for brain metastasis patients. So again, just plotting those same numbers in a graph, you can see at the top of this, you have the HER2 population, highest risk of local failure after stereotactic radiosurgery. But then we looked at the patients who just received stereotactic radiosurgery, and those patients who received stereotactic radiosurgery timed with a HER2 EGFR combined TKI, which is lapatinib, in this patient population. If you timed the agent, you actually had a reduction in the local fare rate from about 15% down to 5%, so essentially one-third of that rate. It also had a modest efficacy on distant failure rates, so again, from 18% down to 9%. This actually was not statistically significant in our series, though. Now, the numbers may seem small, but when you start to plot them and you actually change what your um, Y bar is, you actually see that there is potentially a significant benefit if you combine the radiosurgery and that CNS uh, targeting agent at the same time. This was actually recently tested in the RTOG1119 trial in which patients could receive whole brain radiation therapy or radiosurgery and then plus or minus lapatinib therapy. In fact, the early results from this trial showed that there was a benefit of objective response rate at initial MRI, but then at long-term follow-up, there was no difference. Again, a number of these patients actually over this uh, time of the trial that was run ended up receiving um, HER2 agents with potential CNS penetration. So right now in our practice, we do combine radiosurgery and lapatinib safely and, and hopefully effectively for this patient population.
And then lastly, I'm going to use renal cell carcinoma patients as an example for how we understand factors that may influence the risk of radiation necrosis over just tumor size alone. So we have done some initial work showing that if you had TKI agents, for example, renal cell carcinoma patients, or actually patients receiving um, some of the EGFR directed therapies, together actually had a potentially higher risk of radiation necrosis. Here you can see plotted those patients who did receive TKI and who did not receive TKI at their time of radiosurgery treatment. Again, given this patient population, every one of these patients received TKI. This is before immunotherapy. And so essentially this allows us to tease out that timing question and the risk of radiation necrosis. And if you look at the patients who ended up developing a high rate of radiation necrosis, this is now about 20%. It's patients who received TKI plus had a large lesion. So something that we need to think about, especially as we treat this patient population. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to a couple of special scenarios. This is just to kind of highlight what our modern role of radiosurgery is in areas of, again, evolving evidence development. So traditionally, we know from the Patchell study done about 20 years ago that patients who undergo resection of a brain metastasis, they do need post-operative radiotherapy. In this trial, they randomized patients who underwent resection of a single lesion to observation versus whole brain radiation therapy. And there was a reduction in all three endpoints with regards to surgical bed relapse distant bed relapse, as well as neurologic death. Since then, we, Paul Brown actually led the N107C trial and showed that patients who were randomized to post-operative whole brain radiation therapy over radiosurgery had equivalent survival, but there was a difference in cognitive deterioration-free survival in the patients who received post-operative whole brain radiation therapy compared to stereotactic radiosurgery. And this has kind of led to the use of post-operative stereotactic radiosurgery in an increasing number of patients. Now, compared to whole brain radiation therapy, there have been additional data sets that have been done that show that they have similar rates of local control, uh, better quality of life with physical well being, potentially less toxicity, and a shorter treatment course overall. So, this is something that we are offering to patients. Uh, post operative serotactic radiosurgery is dosed as uh, based on the cavity volume, as you can see here. So, this is our current. Um, SRS guidelines that we use. As you can see here, the risk of radiation necrosis does go up as you get a larger cavity volume. So then we do fractionate those patients out to three or five fractions so that we can make that risk of necrosis about 15% or less. And this is the summary of the studies that have been used to kind of generate this evidence. Now, as opposed to post-operative radiosurgery, there has been an increasing a trend to use preoperative radiosurgery and something that we have been doing um, at this institution as well. And there are many advantages, at least in retrospective series, um, comparing preoperative radiosurgery to postoperative radiosurgery. So again, this is radiosurgery and then anywhere from 24 hours up to one week later, the patient can undergo resection of that lesion. Um, from a dosimetric perspective, we're just treating a lesion versus a postoperative cavity. From a treatment volume standpoint, the lesion is intact, easy to identify, target. There's no margin that is placed. In the postoperative setting, we have to put a two millimeter margin into normal brain tissue to reduce the risk of a marginal failure. There's improved local control with preoperative compared to postoperative radiosurgery. And there's a reduced risk for leptomeningeal disease with preoperative radiosurgery which is really something to be cognizant about to note um, as that is very difficult to salvage. And then those patients subsequently have a higher risk of neurologic death. This is our preoperative um, serotactic dose guidelines actually in use at our center. We actually use a dose escalated um, preoperative radiosurgery approach. This is based on a phase one trial that we had done at uh, Cleveland Clinic. And actually we're currently doing analysis looking at the tissue effects of this of different dosing and different times between radiosurgery and surgery. So actually our initial set of slides of 20 patients or so just got sent out this past week. So hopefully we'll have some additional histologic evidence to help us guide us further in this area. And then finally, the management of large brain metastasis is controversial right now as to what to do. Uh, we're actually going to be doing a teaching seminar on this, but large brain metastasis typically defined as those that are more than two to three centimeters in size are associated with a high local failure rate. This is basically all of the treatments that we have done for those patients, gamma knife alone, gamma knife and whole brain, salvage gamma knife after surgery, surgery and gamma knife. And essentially, the local failure rates are very high, so we need new strategies. This is actually what we use here. We either use a hypofractionated approach, so essentially a three or five fraction approach with radiosurgery, 
or we can do a multi-session or staged approach where patients receive one dose and then four weeks later receive a second dose of radiosurgery. For example, this is a 47-year-old renal cell carcinoma. You can see in the right premortal cortex. So he was treated with a fractionated approach given that this was his only lesion. So it was 27 gray in three fractions. This is the response at four weeks and that's the response actually at eight weeks. He lived about a year and a half and never actually had a local failure at that site. Alternative approach that we use in some patients who under, need a frame, for example, for treating additional lesions in the brain is a staged approach. So this is a similar case. So again, a metastatic renal cell carcinoma, large lesion, posterior fossa, you can see effacement of the fourth ventricle. They get a staged radiosurgery four weeks apart. So we give initial dose, allow the lesion to reduce in size, and then give a boost dose. This means that we don't have to treat the entire initial volume of disease, even with a fractionated approach um, at their initial diagnosis with the full dose. So essentially we're exposing less normal brain with this approach and technique. You can see the follow-up for that patient, essentially then resolution of that lesion in the brain. In this setting, we actually have an um, investigator initiated trial that we are leading that will be opening, I think, next week, in which we're combining not only staged radiosurgery in a prospective fashion, but we're also adding this uh, uh, filvocycline PET CT scan, initial diagnosis at the first stage treatment, and then at their follow up scan. So, potentially, not only can we prospectively evaluate staged radiosurgery and be the first trial in that space, we're also using a new functional imaging biomarker as well for this patient population. So to conclude, hopefully I've uh, done this topic justice um, as asked by Dr. McDermott to cover the role of radiosurgery in the modern era for patients with brain metastases. Um, I think it's brain metastases are significant and commonly encountered and a healthcare burden for us. Um, there are key patient disease specific criteria used to estimate a patient's prognosis. We are continuously refining this criteria so we can better identify and estimate a patient's prognosis. Radiosurgery alone has an evolving role in the management of patients with brain metastasis as a sole treatment modality in patients who have numerous lesions and those who have received prior treatment. But this is now going to be retested against the newer form of whole brain, hippocampal avoidance whole brain radiation therapy. I think those studies are really key to identify what patients should get in the future. You should understand the role of tumor biology and molecular profile in addition to treatment toxicity, treatment outcome, discussions with patients, and then tailor SRS carefully in the post-operative, pre-operative setting, as well as when you're managing large brain metastases. With that, I think I finished right before nine o'clock. Yeah. Well, that was a uh, comprehensive, clear, fluidly delivered presentation. And I'm not just blowing smoke here, but I've sat through a lot of these lectures and that was outstanding. Well, Questions? You. Dr. Rapesh, this is Robert Zek, being excellent presentation, elegant. Um, I wanna to come to the question of timing the agent, especially as we start using more and more immunotherapeutics. Um, and especially if we start employing uh, CAR T cells, which may have another role in penetrating um, CNS metastases. But you have to do it in a form that the um, endothelial barrier is receptive to cellular transmigration. And similarly, some of the immunotherapeutic approaches would probably be enhanced by a timing approach in combination with radiotherapy. So do you know of any centers that are actually exploring uh, discrete uh, ways of introducing immunotherapeutic approaches, including cells, in combination with uh, radiotherapeutic pulses? That's a great question. So for immunotherapies, our area of evidence development is typically in the, of non-small cell lung cancer, brain metastasis, or melanoma, or renal cell, because those are the patients receiving immunotherapies. We did some work actually combining those three um, histologies and patients who received immunotherapy and looked at the patients who received radiosurgery plus immunotherapy, and we looked at the number of half-lives. And we saw that there was an improvement in lesion response rate, the closer that you timed the immunotherapy to the radiosurgery. So right now we actually recommend as close of a timing as possible um, because we did see that that improved the overall response rate and specifically the complete response rate. You actually, if you timed radiosurgery and the systemic therapy at the same time, our complete response rate actually increased to about 40%, maybe 50%. So it was actually significantly higher. We have not seen, and we didn't tease that out, at least in our retrospective studies of uh, neoadjuvant immunotherapy versus doing immunotherapy right after radiosurgery. 
We actually have a trial that is um, uh, undergoing evaluation right now um, for patients um, who are going to receive immunotherapy for melanoma brain metastasis. And it's actually testing the sequencing question, the timing question. And it's also testing which radiosurgery option would be optimal for those patients. So those patients are going to be randomized in a two-by-two -two design to dual immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy followed by radiosurgery or radiosurgery followed by dual immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And then whether a single fraction in a high dose of at least 20 gray is more immunogenic than a three fraction approach at a lower dose per day is going to be the second part of that randomization. Because there is some evidence, um, both in preclinical studies and then evolving in the clinical space, that maybe a lower dose over three fractions is potentially more immunogenic. So I'm going to join your conversations in the future on that topic. So please, you know, cue me in and I'll get in there with you. Okay. Yeah, Robert, this is Manmeet. So I'll, I'll just uh, add to what Rupesh said uh, for the CAR-T, because you asked specifically for the CAR-T. It's not been done in the context of uh, brain metastases so far, but the UPenn uh, effort with Carl Jun and uh, Donald O'Rourke actually looked at a GBM with a hyperfraction at like 40 grays in three weeks with the combination with pembrolizumab and the EGFR V3 CAR-T specifically. Uh, the results are still in the very initial stages. So there is a effort in that regard, but certainly opportunities for us to work together. Excellent, thank you. Um, well, if there's no other questions, 901. Uh, uh, Rupesh, I'm volunteering you for grand rounds at UCSF Radiation Oncology after this talk. So should be straightforward. Just repeat what you did here. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, have a good day, everybody. Happy weekend. Go Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I never thought I'd say go to a team that Tom Brady played for, but now I am. <laughs> have a good, good weekend.